you'll also find this is not difficult in terms of the maths of it, um, but the, like the actual arithmetic and algebra you'll have to do, uh, but it's a new kind of idea. So the heading is approximating roots. Now my avenue into this is this question. You were asked to solve this question in uh, one of your exercises on radians. Okay? Now I am in fact not going to solve it right now. If you looked at this and you struggled with it, particularly the last part which made you just sort of look at it sideways and I don't even know where to start, okay? Then tell me, I will happily come and help you later on. But I just want to point out that this equation, at least with the tools that we have developed over the last 11, 12 years, this equation cannot be solved exactly. You just can't do it. 1 minus a half x doesn't mix this algebra, right? And this trig function, they just don't, we don't have any tools that we can use to arrive at an exact precise solution you're kind of stuck. Now, the funny thing is, for many years you've been solving equations, but we have very deliberately handed you all the ones that are nice and easy to deal with. Then there's a three-step approach or a formula. And we have artfully dodged all of these equations, the kinds of equations that populate all of real life, where you just can't simply solve. You can't find an exact value. All you can do is say, look, I can get something that's close. You know what, in real life, sometimes that's all you need. If I can get in the right ballpark, I can get to a desired level of accuracy, that's all I need, right? It's really just mathematicians who are kind of like, we want it to be exact. In the real world, if you're an engineer, or if you're just like, I need this experiment to be as close as possible, yeah. you just need to be roughly in the right ballpark, and you'll be fine. Okay. So, I'm not gonna solve this one because it actually ends up being a little bit messy. I'm going to pick a simple one. Here's the question I want to pose to you underneath this. The question is, what is the decimal value of the square root of 3? What is the decimal value of the square root of 3? Now, we of course can reach to our calculators and just get a number immediately and um, fairly painlessly. But that then raises the question, like, the calculator can do that because we've trained it to do that. How did it know how to do that, right? What's the process behind actually getting an answer for this? We are going to find the decimal value for root 3. At least we're going to get pretty close. Okay? Now, I think we all know that root 3 as a number, bless you, root 3 as a number, it has to be somewhere between, well, if I can pick some like whole numbers, whole numbers that I know, okay? Um, the nearest square number beneath 3 is 1, right? That's the closest square number closer, less than 3. And the closest square number that's bigger than 3 is 4. Right? So clearly, root 3 must be somewhere between these two numbers. Do you agree with that? So that means it's between 1 and 2. Okay? So I know I, I've got to be in there, but that's a really big range. So how do I get any closer? Right? We're going to learn two methods for doing this. Um, the first method is quite... Uh, it's kind of a brute force method, but it's actually quite simple and elegant. So I'm going to show it to you. The subheading is bisection method. This is the name I give it. Wait, and so yes. So are we still doing the two causes? We're going to solve this. So this is just my example because you've been looking at uh, this question recently. It just exemplifies the fact that you know what? Sometimes you just can't solve. Okay. You just can't do anything to it, right? Uh, and this is another example. So this is called bisection. It is not the name probably that you'll hear most often. Most often you'll hear it called halving the interval. But because in mathematics we have a single word that means halving the interval, namely bisection, I kind of, and you guys have heard of bisecting things before, I see no reason not to use it. Um, I always want to use less words rather than more. So, that was funnier than I thought. Okay. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to do, right? I need to take this, and I'm going to take advantage of all the things I know about coordinate geometry, and so I'm gonna phrase this as a function, okay? Now root three, I think we all agree, root three is the solution, or is a solution, to an equation, right? What's in a solution to the equation? What will be a simple equation where one of the solutions is root three? Okay, now I could go to I could go to trig, right? I could go to trig. That would be fine. Like I know trig is kind of in our minds at the moment, but I'm going to go like even easier than that. How about x squared equals three? Like that will do it. Okay, that's a nice easy function to deal with. I don't have to appeal to trigonometry, which is its own ball of problems. Okay, so this equation 
Root 3 is one of the solutions. Obviously, negative root 3 is the other one. Okay? So I'm going to phrase this in language that will help me solve it. Help me uh, approximate it, rather. x squared equals 3, and x squared minus 3 equals 0. Same equation. Okay? But the whole point of phrasing it like this is now what I'm trying to find is a root to this equation. Do you agree with that? Like, I'm trying to find a place where that equals 0. That's exactly what we define roots to be. Okay. Uh, both of these methods, um, the bisection method and the other one you'll learn, which is called the units method, they're about finding these roots. Finding when you hit zero. Okay. So, let's let f of x equal x squared minus three. Now, um, one of the reasons why I chose this function and not tan is because x squared minus three, in fact, every polynomial is a continuous function. There are no breaks, no cheeks in the, in the whole, I can, Right, draw it with one, one smooth line, okay? So being that it's a continuous function, and it hits zero at some certain point, right? That means that on the left of that, I'm going to be one sign positive or negative, and on the right of that, I should change sign. Do you agree with that? That's the only way you can pass through zero. You've got to change sign. Does that make sense? So what I'm going to look for is a change in sign. Let me show you how it works with these guys, right? If I've got, this is f of x. What's f of 1? It's 1 minus 3, negative 2. Okay. What about f of 2? What value am I going to get there? 1, one right? 4, take away 3. That's 1. Do you see it as a change in sign? Right? I have to change sign between 1 and 2, or rather from 1 to 2, because I know somewhere in the middle I'm going to hit 0. Okay. So I have drawn myself a ridiculously large set of axes over here, and I'm going to encourage you to do the same. You can see I've got 1 and 2 here, because now I have a couple of values here. Now let me emphasize to you, after this first time, I'm not going to expect you're ever going to draw a diagram to demonstrate this ever again. But you need to see what is happening, um, and you particularly to understand why this works, and why it's called bisection method. Okay. So for f of 1, here's my f of x axis against my x axis. f of 1 is going to be negative 2, so I'm just going to draw that as the lowest point I possibly can on my scale. So if I put it down here, f of 1, that makes this negative 2, that means negative 1 is about there. Okay? So there's a point that f of x passes through. The other point that I have, f of 2, is going to be, well, I want it to be roughly the same distance, something like that. So it's about here. There's f of 2. And you can see, I'm negative before, I'm positive after, so somewhere in between, I'm going to slice through the axis and get this root that I'm after. Make sense? 